Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the webinar on personal protective equipment with the Australian Deputy Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Nick Coatesworth. Um, we're very pleased to have you with us today. Um, and it's great to see so many people, so many participants. Uh, we've been overwhelmed with numbers. On behalf of the Royal Australasian College of Surgeons, I'd like to extend our special thanks to our, our special guest, Dr. Nick Coatesworth. Um, I'm John Viviano, I'm the CEO of the college. Um, Dr. Coatesworth is a Deputy Chief Medical Officer and he'll be talking specifically about personal protective equipment and its use during the COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Coatesworth brings together two of the most important factors in the fight against coronavirus. He's a respiratory specialist and an infectious diseases specialist. He has extensive experience in health emergencies and epidemics around the world, including training OSMAT clinicians during the Ebola virus disease outbreaks. Nick's contribution to the Department of Health's response to the coronavirus will provide frontline experience and a voice for clinicians at the highest level. This will help ensure the measures we are taking to protect the Australian community focus on people's individual needs. I'm also pleased to welcome our president, Mr. Tony Sparnan, who will shortly say a few words. I also welcome Professor Guy Madden, RAC's Surgical Director of, Sur of Research and Evaluation, incorporating ASINIPS, and Dr. Bridget Clancy, ear, nose and throat surgeon and chair of RAC's Rural Surgery Section Committee, who will be participating in the Q&A session. Just a few logistics to share with you. After Tony and Nick speak, we will have a Q&A session. Tony and Nick will be joined by Bridget and Guy, and I'm sure that between the four of them, they'll be able to answer your questions. I thank the Specialty Society presidents and fellows who have submitted questions. I also encourage you to use the question box to write any other questions that you may have that are related to PPE. I will do my best to collate your written questions and we'll get as many as possible answered in the time we have. So just bear with me, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. So now uh, I'd like to uh, hand over to uh, Tony Sparner to introduce the session. Thanks, John, uh, and welcome everybody. It's great that there's so many people who have joined us. And from the outset, could I uh, pass a big thanks to Nick uh, and his other deputy CMOs and to Brendan for the wonderful job they've been doing and keeping us up to date and informed. Uh, most days of the week, it start for me at 7 a.m. with a discussion somewhere or other with Nick, and he's given our college magnificent service. And, and I do want to thank you enormously, Nick, uh, for making yourself available today. It was just, um, I was just thinking today, it was only three months ago, I was in Dublin with the, the, the Royal College of Surgeons in, in, in Ireland, and we had all the college presidents together thinking about, talking about what we would do in a crisis hit the colleges, hit the Royal Colleges. and. In fact, the uh, scenario we used in the book that the greatest risk to us was terrorism. And we could uh, imagine that uh, a whole lot of surgeons being wiped out at a conference and what that would do. One, one uh, invited speaker was from China and couldn't come because he had a virus and, and didn't want to travel. And so we didn't realize how close we were to the uh, pandemic back then. And, and indeed, uh, we hadn't guessed that, that, that such an event could occur so quickly and how it's affected our, our life as surgeons and our life in the world. So uh, uh, it's been a very short time scale. So up to now, all our, our, our societies and, our, and most of the presidents are, are in part of this web, uh, webinar today, and I thank them very much for, for all the work you've been doing. But we've been, we've been discussing uh, guidelines and how best we can do in our individual specialties uh, based on very little evidence. And it's wonderful that uh, Guy and Asinips have done so much work just in the last week in, in, in really finding some very hard evidence to help us move forward and to, to try and get some uh, uh, joint positions on this so we're all doing the same thing. And of course, today is a big day to hold this uh, webinar because the, the, the decision to uh, go back and, and reduce the reduction in um, the bands on active surgeons have come out. Not that I've had a, a chance to read them, but I understand and, and have seen that most of them agree with the policy document that we put forward and, and our press release on Friday. And so we'll all catch up with that. 
but in particular, it, it stresses the importance of PPE, which we're addressing today. And Nick is going to tell us some of the questions that uh, try and answer some of the questions we have about as we introduce our surgery. And the other area we've we've uh, we've done a lot of talk basically about Sydney and Melbourne, occasionally Brisbane, but certainly the, the smaller areas and the rural areas and in regional areas in particular, their view uh, hasn't been uh, fully discussed. So it's, it's really great that Bridget is here to specifically look at some of the areas which are quite quite different. In a, in a in a in areas that might only have a few surgeons, what happens if, if they are affected? So uh, you don't want to hear from me. I'll ask Nick if you could uh, start talking to us, please, Nick, and tell us about the PPE and uh, availability and, and and how we should use it. Thanks. Um, thanks so much, Tony and 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 John for those introductions and the. <coughs> Of the collaboration over the past uh, couple of weeks, as, as Tony said, it's been really significant, and and you know Tony's always available on on the other end of the phone. A as are a variety of uh, surgical colleagues across the country that I've I've encountered during my professional career, and in, including those at, at Canberra Health Services, uh, who have also been speaking to me regularly and. and you know, I think that's the advantage, uh, if I may, that that you know someone who's actually a, a practicing clinician, albeit not a, a, a proceduralist. I'm not unfamiliar with the operating theatre from my time as a respiratory uh, physician doing uh, doing bronchoscopies, uh, but nonetheless, five weeks ago uh, was was really uh, practicing as a full-time staff specialist at um, Canberra Hospital. Uh, also, with you know so a small amount of uh, VMO work over at, at National Capital Private as well. So I guess w with that in mind, um, you know I feel like the role here is to make sure that when the Commonwealth is is dis making decisions at a hospital level, and we know that the systems uh, sort of operators of, of hospitals are either the private hospitals or the jurisdictions themselves. That it's important to get some of that real uh, practical experience um, to the extent that I can offer that. And and one of the things that I'm conscious of is that you know I'm I'm not a surgeon. I'm not at the same risk as surgeons or anaesthetists uh, from COVID-19. Uh, despite the fact that in two months I I will go back to uh, practicing in infectious diseases medicine at Canberra Hospital and and will be in that again in in that COVID environment. So that's that's just a little bit about me. I've got a I've got a stopwatch on next to me, so I don't um, sort of rabbit along. And and my intent is to uh, really answer questions about personal protective equipment today. Uh, I will try and uh, quarantine some time at the end on the issue of elective surgery uh, just because that is so topical at the moment. Uh, I will spend two minutes though just just making a really critical point because I've, I know that um, private hospital CEOs as we speak uh, um, and, and uh, also presumably public administrators are, as well are getting uh, calls uh, from our surgical colleagues, maybe some of yourselves have, have put that call through asking when uh, the lists can restart. So I just want to make one thing very clear that the intent of the reintroduction of elective surgery is one that is um, staged, safe and cautious and, and that is essentially to limit the throughput of patients for the next month. We want to we want to move from the public category ones and urgent twos into uh, many of the twos and some of the um, category threes. And I, I fully uh, understand that that categorization is not ideal for the private sector. So uh, Tony Sparnan has facilitated a meeting with the heads of the um, your specialist craft groups uh, where we will look at a more, uh, whilst not a definitive list, certainly a guiding uh, list of procedures. But in order to regulate that volume. What, what we don't want is a huge uh, sort of catch-up list uh, to occur every day of next week, where you've got you know 20 cataracts being done in a day, or um, or X number of uh, of hips um, being done. We know the patients are out there in need of the surgery, but we've got to regulate the flow. So the principle that you will hear from either the private hospital or public hospital uh, nurse managers or the 
or the CEOs or, or whoever you are engaging directly with at the moment is that um, one in four of uh, current available capacity in terms of the lists will be made available for elective surgery. Now, unfortunately, that doesn't mean that every surgeon will go back to one in four. It may be that some surgeons um, do a higher amount. It's maybe that some surgeons do less than that. But as a capacity issue, that's what we're going to be advocating um, for. So we can get back to that a bit later. Um, I'd like to talk personal protective equipment and I'm going to open up um, firstly with, with two minutes just outlining a, a calculation um, of prevalence and risk um, based on COVID-19 in Australia at the moment, which I think can inform the discussion before I get into the questions. The, uh, we, can, we can estimate prevalence based on 14-day cumulative incidents. And we did that last week with two of our epidemiologists here and calculated that in Victoria uh, last week, um, early last week, the 14-day the cumulative incidence of COVID-19 was about 6.4 per 100,000. At the same time in Sydney, it was about, in New South Wales as a whole, it's about five per 100,000. Now that 14-day cumulative incidence would have decreased over the, uh, over the past seven days since they did that calculation. But for the sake of argument, let's say that in the, one of the worst affected areas, uh, of the country, that, that was the prevalence. Then we plugged in a few numbers uh, about the probability of encountering a pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic COVID-19 patient. The, the likely ratio is probably somewhere less than one pre-symptomatic to four symptomatic COVID patients. That's based on modelling done from the Diamond Princess. And that's about the highest range that we've seen in the published literature so far. So it doesn't suggest, it's not a inverse ratio. It's not like there's a big um, tip of the iceberg or, or big uh, bit of the iceberg underneath of asymptomatic patients out there. Um, that's what the data shows and that's also what the local experience shows. So we, we took a liberal interpretation of that ratio and said, okay, we're going to say there's one um, asymptomatic person to every two symptomatic people. Um, and then we wanted to get a transmission estimate of the likelihood of a practitioner acquiring COVID-19 from a given interaction. And so we used the household transmission rate of, of, uh, of 35%, which is likely significantly higher than one would experience in the healthcare setting. When we put those numbers together, 6.4 per 100,000, um, one in two uh, likelihood uh, of encountering a uh, asymptomatic um, patient as opposed to a symptomatic patient, and a 35% likelihood of transmission. We ended up with a risk per patient encounter of one uh, per 100,000 patient encounters in Australia. You can see that those numbers are, are not going to be perfect, but they are indicative of, of risk. And I think that's where we need to start our discussion on PPE. And I, I use the numbers because it gives a bit of substance to the comment that you, you'll hear a lot from, um, from Brendan and from the Prime Minister and the Health Minister, which is that um, we are not the US or we are not Italy. And of, of course we know, we know that, but but, I thought I'd present those numbers as a way of, of indicating actually the risk is extraordinarily low at the moment. Um, not nothing, obviously, um, but in some jurisdictions may start um, getting even lower. And we know that some jurisdictions haven't had any um, uh, cases in a number of days. So with that in mind, I'm, I'm, Tony, are you happy if I go um, launch straight into the questions? I think um, I think I think I'm going to take that as a yes. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Please go ahead, and, and John can, uh, can can give some of the the ones which have been sent in. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So certainly one of the the questions that we are having um, is about the safety of uh, of people, which you've addressed. I think in terms of the the risk, um, are we going to be safe? Um, and I think um, that goes some way towards that. Um, 
and also the issue of routine testing and how accurate the testing is and should everyone be tested say pre-operatively so that was uh, I guess a couple of questions in that one for you yeah so the uh, on on the first issue so the one in 100,000 is not not to um, say there's no risk at all it's just to, just to give a quantification of the risk as being very very low so then as, as you're all aware the next step in your sort of hierarchy of protection from a workplace health and safety perspective is the what what they term administrative procedures so um, uh, and I, I am preaching to the converted, but I think it's important that we're all on the same page here. Um, so in an outpatient um, surgical sort of preoperative setting, or you're seeing a postoperative patient in your rooms, those administrative controls largely centre around um, your administration staff being able to um, identify or, or query patients as they, before they come in as to whether they have any respiratory symptoms and to uh, get them to come in at another time when they're, they're not symptomatic or if they absolutely uh, need to be seen when they're symptomatic, which should be quite a small percentage in an outpatient setting, um, then they need to be um, provided with a surgical mask, of course, uh, if, if you absolutely have to see them. Um, now, that, that is working for surgeons, um, physicians, general practitioners, that is how we are going to have to be um, unless we find ourselves with a vaccine. So, so those sort of administrative controls need to be in place. Um, similar perioperative administrative controls in terms of when you're able to, your anaesthetist is able to quiz them um, before the procedure, um, on the day of the procedure, um, uh, as they are admitted to hospital, you know, there will be a number of points um, that the patients should be asked about their symptoms. Now, I completely acknowledge that patients may underestimate their symptoms, but our feeling is that really, if they're being asked every step of the way, um, then they will eventually understand that this is a big deal, in particular when they're faced with the um, possibility that if they minimise their symptoms for the sake of surgery and they have COVID-19, not only are they are risk to staff, but their chance of post-operative complication is really significantly high. So I would, um, encourage that tool uh, to be used in discussions with patients. Um, and then PPE is your last line of control. Um, so we, we have all those controls in, at the front end to try and avoid seeing um, even a, a, a symptomatic COVID-19 patient. We know that the, the likelihood of symptomatic, asymptomatic patient turning up is really very unlikely. Um, and then we use, um, we are recommending the use of um, standard universal precautions um, for surgical um, procedures uh, at this point in time. And then um, we can, I can go into uh, specific head and neck things. I might invite um, Bridget to talk about that in a second. On the testing side, and I know I'm talking a, a heck of a lot at the moment, but um, preoperative testing, could it, could it have a role? And I th think again, in a, in a, higher prevalence setting um, with a very large number of tests available, I think preoperative testing would have a role uh, in, in um, ensuring safe staff safety. The problem is when your prevalence is so low, you end up burning through tests that would otherwise be used by the public health authorities in a very targeted way to stamp out clusters. So if you can imagine the following strategy that a public health unit will use, and you know, Northwest Regional might be a decent example, but any community outbreak would be an example. You find a symptomatic patient, you do the contact tracing, um, you look within that community for patients with minimal symptoms um, and you test them, respiratory symptoms, uh, but not necessarily meaning the case um, definition, you test them. You might pick some members of that community that are asymptomatic and you test them and you work out in a cocoon um, according to what the local public health unit um, want to do. Now that's the way that you do the, um, you stamp out COVID-19 in a very low prevalence environment. It does take a lot of tests to do that and they have to be available and you have to get a rapid turnaround. If we start elective surgery, let's take hips for an example, and Andrew Ellis mentioned to me 
uh, yesterday that there's about 10,000 hips done a month in Australia. If you were to preoperatively test every patient undergoing a hip procedure in Australia, you would, at, at the moment, you would put a really significant dent in our national um, testing capacity um, for what is what is a, not a great gain in a low prevalence environment. Now, before I hand over to Guy to, to have some more comment on the testing, we, ha we have heard, personally, I have heard loud and clear the concerns about asymptomatic patients, both from my um, uh, discussions with ENT colleagues and ASOMs in particular, um, due to their risk. Um, now, we will be undertaking a study. It won't be a blanket where we're testing everybody who's preoperative pre and asymptomatic, but we will be undertaking a study of several thousand patients who are going to undergo elective surgery to try and determine accurately what the prevalence of COVID-19 in asymptomatic preoperative patients is. Based on the calculation I told you, we should only get zero or one case per 3,000 if we en enrol uh, 3,000 patients. Uh, but nonetheless, that has been committed to by National Cabinet today. So I'd be very grateful if um, you could refrain from testing your patients preoperatively. Uh, there will be testing done uh, within the more effective affected jurisdictions in a in a cohort study type environment. Guy, can I pass on to you now, perhaps just to um, comment a little bit on the, that testing side? Oh, um, sorry, share my webcam just a second. Yes, look, thank you very much. That's been a very helpful um, discussion, and I think those figures are extremely helpful to try and understand. Certainly. Uh, this issue of the asymptomatic group seems to be challenging to get a clear number on. And um, the Italian, early Italian experience we turned up was about 30% asymptomatic, but that really was with a different sort of testing regime and not particularly clear whether they really were asymptomatic. So uh, we don't, as you've pointed out, we don't exactly know what our asymptomatic rate is. Um, we would argue the Council of Perfection, of course, is to test patients before, but we have to be realistic and acknowledge that the availability of these tests is limited and we've got to decide how they're best used. Um, I'm sure, um, and Bridget will probably comment about this, I'm sure targeting uh, aerosol producing procedures makes some sense um, and ENT are the particular uh, group that are involved in this, but so too are those with uh, bronchoscopies and uh, upper GI um, uh, endoscopies. Um, However, uh, I, I think for the moment, if we use, as you've suggested, the administrative approaches um, with the ability to test those that we have genuine concerns about and maybe particular procedures, that would seem to be a rational way to go forward at the moment with the information we have. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a really good assessment, um, Guy. I, I, I want to make some um, comments on the national medical stockpile because I think you know that's often um, thought of as some sort of uh, cloak and dagger um, type uh, situation. Uh, it, it is the case that um, I think the the location is classified information. Um, the um, the amount of PPE in the stockpile by um, I think by convention rather than regulation is 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 usually not disclosed even by the minister. Um, but paradoxically, we we do talk about the amount of stuff that's coming into the stockpile, so you can sort of infer um, how much is in there from that. Just on N95 PPE, because the the temptation is for um, bronchoscopy, endoscopy, um, nasal endoscopy, and um, head and neck cancer surgery um, that we would want to use that sort of PPE, uh, even for an asymptomatic patient. There, there is going to be an implication on our uh, N95 stocks of that sort of use. And uh, the, the uh, price of an N95 on the international market at the moment is $10, whereas before it was 67 cents. Um, so there is, uh, and we've ordered 80 million. So that, that there's an enormous, um, amount of money going into that. Now that's not to say that we shouldn't use them when they're appropriately indicated, but just to give people a sense of, of the costs. 
the supply chains are also not great. We can be completely open about that, that when you hear about um, a surgical mask coming in, the N95s are coming in at a rate of about uh, one N95 to every 100 surgical masks. Um, so even though we could order um, millions of N95s, there's an international shortage of the polymer that's used to produce them. It's not that um, we could set up a factory here, there's actually a shortage of the material, as you can imagine, with what's going in, on in the US and, 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 and China. So that's some of the constraints around N95. It's a, it's a separate discussion to the risk discussion, but um, it's, I think it's important for members to know that as well. Uh, then, then it's a question of, well, now that we've said that we can do upper GI endoscopy, uh, what should we do when a patient comes in who's asymptomatic, reports no contact history, um, we've done a thorough assessment and the anaesthetist seen them, uh, you know, they've had four people ask them the same question and they haven't admitted to any symptoms. Do we wear N95 precautions at this point in time? And I have to say that with the current prevalence in Australia, even in some of the, uh, even in Victoria and New South Wales, our recommendation would um, would still be to wear a standard surgical mask in that sort of situation, based on based on the prevalence. Um, now, in localised outbreaks where, um, which are likely to happen, I've, I think um, Northwest Regional is a classic example. Local public health authorities are more than entitled to take a different view, and surgeons and anaesthetists would be more than entitled to talk to their local public health authorities to get that guidance. And I think the RACS, uh, ANSCA and uh, the AHPPC papers have all been very clear that uh, into this, this broad guidance can change based on local epidemiology. Bridget, did you want to um, make a comment from the ENT um, side as well? Yeah, thank you, Nick. Um... We've had some awful stories from our colleagues overseas about the rate of infection acquired by healthcare workers from aerosol generating procedures in ENT theatres and in rooms. Um, and for the non-ENT people in the audience, everything we do in the rooms is an aerosol generating procedure. So even spraying local anaesthetic into the nose, examining the mouth, draining a quinsy, treating epistaxis, suctioning an ear, and also using our endoscopes. Um, which we can do up to 10, 20 times a day. So at the moment, all ENT surgery is off apart from thyroidectomy and really urgent cancer surgery. And we're all scrambling to get N95 masks for our rooms so that we can undertake cancer endoscopy diagnostics. Um, it would be really helpful for us to have that level of granular regional data to tell us that the prevalence in some areas is so low that we can actually open our rooms again and start to see patients. Um, the other question I wanted to ask you, Nick, was I haven't been able to watch the whole press conference that the Prime Minister gave earlier today, but I understand that one of the areas of surgery that will open up first is surgery on people under 18 years of age who are having a day surgery. And for ENT, that means little kids with hearing loss having ventilation tubes or having yeah. tonsillic adenoidectomy for sleep apnea. But we're also seeing reports from overseas that Suctioning the middle ear is an aerosol generating procedure and using diathermy um, can result in viable virus in smoke plume, even with smoke evacuation devices, and that the powered instrumentation that we use is further aerosol generating. So what could seem like a great, easy, small way to start up again, we're concerned that we risk um, contaminating the theatre and infecting our healthcare team. And to put my rural hat on, we don't have other teams that can come in and replace our teams. You know, we work in constrained resource environments. And if we infect a, a theatre team, that has an enormous impact on the region. So what would you recommend? Yeah, I think they're, um, they're all critical points. I, I think um, the issue of droplet and, 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 and aerosol for uh, COVID-19 has been looked at by the infection control expert group and they're about to put out some national guidelines uh, just to update us. It, there's not much new in there to be honest but there's a few little gems that I think can respond to some of those those questions. One of them is that uh, there is some evidence and you're everybody's aware, Guy will be aware, um, anybody who's looked into this um, knows that the evidence around viral load and how much 
um, COVID-19 or any respiratory virus actually gets aerosolized is really quite sketchy. But um, I, the infection control expert group, and I'll, I'll just spend two seconds saying this is a group of uh, current practitioners within the hospital system who reports directly to the Australian Health Protection Principal Committee. So infection control nurses, infectious disease physicians, microbiologists um, by and large, and it was set up after Ebola in 2014. Um, so that's the group, a uh, sort of group behind the scenes. You don't hear much about ICAG, but they're the ones that look at all the guidelines. ICAG are going to um, put out a statement that indicates that um, for the less than five micron droplets that can be created through aerosol generating procedures, there is at least um, some evidence, though sketchy, that the amount of virus in that is a thousand times lower than in, a, in an actual droplet. So it, it still appears to be the case that the most important thing to protect oneself against for COVID-19 is a droplet, not an aerosol. Um, so that, that will come out and that, that might be useful to know. Then I think we have to be better at uh, answering that question you raised firstly, Bridget, which is the, the local health district level of detail about what's going on um, with prevalence or even, um, even raw numbers, I think, can help and when the last positive case was diagnosed. Mm -hmm. Now, depending on where one is in Australia, there is that information uh, published by some um, jurisdictions. Uh, so we, I'll have a look and see how many, uh, but um, I'm reasonably certain that there's heat maps uh, currently in New South, New South Wales. Uh, and I would suspect um, many of the jurisdictions have that. Obviously, it doesn't go down to um, postcode level, it's LHD level, and, um, mm. uh, but, but uh, I think that would still be, um, still be useful. So would you be comfortable for um, ENT surgeons to be doing endoscopy in their rooms without N95 masks? I think at the moment with the current prevalence level uh, and the appropriate administrative controls to be sure that the patient um, uh, wasn't under-reporting their symptoms, I mean you can't be sure of that, but the patient doesn't have symptoms, um, then yes I would. Yeah, I think, I think you can do it without an N95 at the moment, given the current levels. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one of the questions, um, it's John here, one of the questions we keep getting from our members and particularly today we had a forum with all our state and territory uh, colleagues is the availability of PPE. You talked about the national stockpile but one of the problems that we keep hearing is that the availability of PPE and the right type of PPE is not always there um, and is there a way of yeah. making sure yeah. that there is enough equipment across the country and is there a way of making sure that equipment can be moved around as necessary? Um, so yep. obviously there's some concern about that. Thanks, Nick. So it, it, I guess it's an issue um, that seems to have come up because you know it's an issue within our, our family. My wife's a, a respiratory physician, and and particularly for private rooms and private hospitals, and how one accesses the national stockpile, if at all, and it it is difficult when people see announcements that say, well, there's 11 million masks that have just been distributed around to um, pharmacists, physiotherapists, uh, allied health, et cetera, et cetera, and then um, wonder why they are going, have, having to go to the open market and, and purchase them. Um, we're also aware of issues about um, you know, supply, particularly for, for lo smaller um, practices and or smaller private providers where um, you know, there's essentially shysters on the market that are selling um, very expensive and low or no quality um, uh, surgical surgical masks. So they're not they're not actually up to standard. So that that's just some of the issues that are that are happening at the at the moment. The um, PPE can be accessed through um, a primary health network, um, and I think we've um, We've got some work to do internally about how we either facilitate access of people to reputable suppliers. That would be probably the first thing to do. Um, and secondly, um, have some sort of extraordinary mechanism that if, um, for example, um, a rural ENT practice that was servicing a reasonable, a, 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 you know, a rural population, 
that, that they couldn't get PPE, what is the mechanism for that practice? Who clearly needs to wear um, standard, you know, standard PPE, or may need to in some situations wear N95 PPE, depending on local prevalence. Uh, and I, I completely concede that there is not an easy mechanism um, to access the. In fact, there is no mechanism to access the stockpile now, short of going to the primary health networks. Um, so we need to we need to take that on board. Um, and the same thing's been said by the private hospitals. I will make one thing clear from the private hospital perspective though, because it's going to be relevant with the elective surgery resumption. Um, private hospitals can access the national medical stockpile um, if uh, for the treatment of COVID patients, if they have COVID patients in their hospital. Um, but if it's for elective surgery, then it will be about us facilitating access um, to PPE's uh, procurement um, mechanisms rather than supplying out of the NMS. Thanks, Nick. Um, one of the other questions that we've been getting about masks is that they shouldn't be necessarily changed with each case, with every case, if not soiled. Um, and there's data to suggest that they're effective for many hours um, and that a standard surgical mask may be worn over the P2 or N95 mask to reduce soiling. Um, does the department recommend how long a mask can be worn before changing? Um, so, you know, and things like that. So, I mean, obviously we're getting lots of specific questions around the appropriate use of masks and how long they're effective for. Yeah. Um, so, I, again, you know, I, I won't keep rabbiting on about the low prevalence environment. Let, let's let's move the discussion to a, a sort of imagining that we're in a higher prevalence environment and what, what should we do? Because it's a better way to answer that question. Um, there are, um, for N95s, uh, the, there are some anaesthetists um, with the um, blessing of their ID physicians in major urban centres that are wearing their N95s for a one session. Uh, so that they could be used for four hours, provided they didn't get um, soiled or needed to be replaced because because there were was fluid on them. That that won't be part of the official guidance coming out. Oh, um, uh, Pr uh, Professor Gilbert's got a um, uh, got a specific mask paper coming out in the coming days. So I'll I'll see if there's any reference to that. But there's certainly places that are following the US um, process on that. So you can wear your, your masks for many hours. Um, some uh, institutions, I think the Victorian DHHS is actually recommending um, surgical mask use for every patient encounter. Um, similarly, that that mask could be um, used, obviously if you encountered a COVID patient, you have to doff all your PPE, that's, that, that's clear. But for patients um, who are asymptomatic and don't have respiratory tract infection, uh, I, my understanding is their emergency docs and nurses are wearing um, the masks. Um, now, again, the added benefit of that in a really low prevalence environment is, is, is quite unclear. And it ends up being this sort of, um, this pyramid of prevalence or, or, or context where you might um, wear it, wear the surgical mask. It speaks to a question down here, why aren't we recommending um, face masks for the community? And it's it's the same argument, just it's even more pertinent that um, the benefit of you uh, wearing a mask around the community isn't there. The WHO doesn't recommend it. Um, the only circumstance where it might have a role is very concentrated local um, outbreaks, I think, or or in the United States, in New York City, where it, where it would clearly have a role um, for patient and and more of a role not to, as you know, not to stop you from acquiring infection, but if you had infection, wearing a surgical mask prevents you expectorating. So that that's where the value of community mask use probably lies. Thanks, uh, Nick. Um, next question is around really um, just building on that. Um, We've had lots of questions from different specialty groups about what is appropriate for a particular procedure, an office-based procedure, for example. Um, and um, when you're getting down to the nitty gritty of different procedures, are there guidelines for each of these? And I might just turn to, to Tony Spahn and just to comment on this, given that we have our connections back to our specialty societies first and then on to Nick. Thanks, Tony. Well, we thank our specialty societies. 
they've all come up with their with their own guidelines and and uh, these are living documents because the evidence has changed since uh, most uh, societies and associations started them and uh, and and uh, so the, the the facts have changed and thanks to guy a lot of facts have just changed over the weekend um but one of the things that we we mentioned this morning and, and i know that uh, nick's concerned about is that there are so many guidelines out there at the moment and they often contradict each other. Uh, and, and so whether we should have an overarching, uh, certainly in, in an operating theatre, the nursing, uh, anaesthetist and surgeon should all be following the same guidelines. And we've heard of uh, disputes occurring in theatres when people are following different guidelines. So certainly um, with the, that started today, in fact, with some guidelines going out with the, uh, with the anaesthetist to the uh, ACORN and to us uh, and to the ophthalmologists and to the obstetricians. So we're now uh, getting together um, broad guidelines. But once again, Nick, I know that will be something um, that you're very, and, and Brendan are very keen on, that uh, all guidelines now are somehow co coordinated. Yeah, and no, I th think, thanks, Tony. And, and you know, your support um, to get that, um, seek that input is is fantastic and, and I think from the specialty society's perspective you know we uh, I've undertaken not to sit on those we we know that people have spent a lot of time getting the evidence together and it's not um, incumbent on us to then then get them and and wait for several weeks while we we turn them around uh, but we would like to sort of again advance that role of the infection control expert group to take a look at those guidelines, make some commentary, um, not necessarily um, override a specialist society, that's um, that's not ICAG's role, uh, but it would certainly um, seek to um, sort of align uh, the guidelines as, as much as we can. Yeah, it's just perhaps worth adding, we've, uh, for the College of Surgeons, we've put together um, a document on PPE, which has gone, I think, to Brendan's committee today, um, and we're hoping it'll be turned around quite quickly. And that certainly, it, it, it absolutely is in sync with the ANSCA guidelines, but it relates particularly to surgical practice um, and, and the surgeon's needs. So that should be available, you know, we hope within another couple of days. And that will, I, I think, at least give an evidence appraisal of what's going on. And, Nick's made the point already that the evidence is changing and it's a lot of the recommendations we've seen have not been evidence-based, they've been eminence-based and that's never very helpful. So we've tried to couch this uh, in the terms of what the evidence tells us uh, regarding PPE and not what uh, you know uh, particular groups have felt was appropriate. Thanks, Guy. Um, I think we've covered a lot of the questions that I've got um, in front of me. I mean, I think one of one of the things that, that is interesting about face masks is, and, and that we're being asked also, is that should should they be worn out there in the community as well, um, and whether that's effective or not. Um, I mean, what are your views on that, Nick? <coughs> uh, I th I think on on a, in a very low prevalence environment. Mm -hmm. No, I, I know there. I mean, I don't think um, you know. There's there's all sorts of uh, stuff going on in the community, both our medical community and the wider community. People being vilified for wearing surgical masks in the community, um, and in the same same way as I'm not keen on vilifying anyone who chooses to wear an N95 mask. Uh, you know, it's important that people who choose to do that in the community aren't aren't, aren't vilified. Um, but there, it, it's it's not necessary for um, for us here, and and the evidence that it's been useful in Singapore and and Hong Kong, I just think it's worth making the point. Um, it seems a bit, um, you know, lowbrow to say we're different to other countries. Of course we are, but when you start pointing at individual things like the 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 spread in Hong Kong or Singapore was lessened because of surgical masks. It is not an epidemiologically tenable thesis to have um, because of all the other things that would would potentially con confound it. Um, so we, we ha we're going with the WHO at the moment, who who don't recommend it. As um, WHO is yeah in a in a bit of bit of strife at the moment, I guess. But um, but we're going in there uh, for that recommendation. Thank you, Nick. Um, 
So um, I guess coming back to the availability of masks um, across the nation, do you think there's any opportunity uh, for the Commonwealth to ensure that PPE is, is spread around and there's some mechanism for that to occur, particularly if there's a hospital that's run out of PPE and wants to access PPE? Is that something that the federal government can coordinate? So what we're going, yes, yes it is. Um, there, we, we will ask uh, each individual hospital to work out a PPE burn rate. Uh, not that that will be uh, necessarily fed into the Commonwealth, but if a hospital does ask for um, personal protective equipment, we will want to know what their burn rate is and we'll want to look at the, um, the, the procedures. This, this is mainly to do with, um, with privates, I guess, because the public um, sector can access um, through the state jurisdictions and, and so on and so forth. Um, I mean, we, we, we're keen on that stockpile um, being used if we get spikes in cases and we really have to dump a a whole heap of PPE in a regional sort of area very, very quickly. That that it was always the intent of the stockpile. Um, that said, uh, I think there is a um, there is a case uh, to you know give, certainly given the amount of surgical masks that are coming in. There there are hundreds of millions, and we will get onshore production soon. So again, facilitating some access to that, whether it is um, that that is likely to be via uh, the same suppliers. Um, uh, or potentially um, some sort of purchase arrangement, I guess. Uh, for but now, now I'm now you've got me going way beyond my pay grade, so I better stop <laughs> stop on that. Yes, yeah, so some of the questions we've had are from private providers in terms of what do they do if they run out of masks? Is there someone they can ring up in private practice, for example? Is that, well, is the, that the, information the, the, available? Private hospitals know that they can go direct to the stockpile. It's just that yeah. if they don't have an emergency yeah. department, they're not treating COVID patients, they're down yeah. on the priority list. Yeah. Pri yeah. Individual private providers don't have good access at the moment um, yeah. to the stockpile. So they're, they're really relying, and and that's, um, that's more us getting them uh, a way to purchase, I think, than saying mm. the stockpile is necessarily for private practices. Um, yep. because, because it hasn't traditionally been that. Yeah. So, John, can, can I ask a question? Uh, Nick, if, if somebody, a uh, healthcare provider, uh, has had contact and has been told by the hospital to self-isolate for 14 days, what should they do at home to protect their family, their kids? So what, how, yeah. how should they conduct themselves around the home? Yeah. Um, so, uh, a social isolation, physical distancing from your own family. And, um, you know, a lot of us sit within uh, medical families. So we've got um, either doc a doctor or a nurse uh, as a spouse. Uh, and certainly that's the case in my, uh, my own situation. So there's a couple of ways you can deal with it. You can, you can technically physical distance in, in the household environment. Um, it's, you have to keep your 1.5 meters, perform hand hygiene, have a separate bathroom, um, things that sound rather draconian um, and uh, of questionable efficacy. Uh, so that, you know, some I know some colleagues have elected uh, to either self-isolate somewhere else, uh, a hotel, or even have approached their health service to provide accommodation. Um, so all of those uh, options, we don't recommend one over the other, um, simply acknowledging that it's a, a very, very challenging thing to do within one's, um, one's own home uh, without being, but it's, it's not completely impossible if your home's um, big enough to do it, I guess. That's, that's the sort of honest, pragmatic and somewhat unsatisfactory answer. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Um, I think um, the, the other, yeah, I think we've exhausted most of the questions. Um, Bridget, did you have any particular questions? Sorry, Nick. I was, I was going to say, did we want to move on to some online questions? Are there any online questions about elective surgery and resumption? Yes, yeah, so I think some of the questions are around um, the safe resumption of elective surgery, in which cases are done, um, and how that can be done um, carefully and systematically. 
um, in a general sense. Yes. So um, there's there's a lot of challenges here, and I guess the three main the the the, the three main ways that someone can access surgical care: public patient in a public hospital, um, public patient in a private hospital through a bed by arrangement, or a private um, patient in a private hospital. And they're all subject to different sort of processes and regulatory frameworks, and that's why it's difficult to say let's do this in a controlled uh, fashion. We really expect, we really rely a lot on individual providers and colleagues uh, to be able to do that um, with the recognition that if we don't, we could end up with a hospital outbreak inadvertently because we let the floodgates open. The way we're going to and, and there are some pointy end regulatory instruments here. Um, I don't think uh, anyone would want to necessarily use them, but there is a private hospital guarantee that is in existence at the moment. Um, and there's also the Biosecurity Act itself, uh, which is a pretty powerful legislative tool. But that we steer away from that and talk about a, a more um, collaborative sort of approach to this. And the way we're going to do it is we've got, um, we've asked one in four um, uh, of list capacity that exists at the moment. So say a day surgery is doing nothing, they'll be able to increase to 25%. That's our recommendation. Say a private hospital is doing 50% of its previous work, well, they'll be able to look at the remaining 50% and start a quarter of that again. Um, and that's, that's the sort of how we're gonna open the, floodgates in a, in a controlled fashion. How are we going to monitor that? We've got MBS data, of course, that we can see. Um, we've got a real-time uh, heat map of intensive care admissions in public and private sector that is live at the moment. So we're going to be able to see what the impact of this is on intensive care admissions. That's critical. Um, Intensive care capacity, as you probably know, in some places is down to 60 to 70 percent of what it was before the elective surgery shut down. Um, that monitoring is going to take place at the two-week mark and then at the four-week mark, and it's going to inform the um, National Cabinet decision of four weeks about what to do in the future. Um, you know, I, I would simply say to colleagues that it's it's really important that um, we work with each other, that we don't end up in, in conflict, either between surgeon, anaesthetist, um, other physician colleagues, or hospital administration. We understand that it is, um, it is a difficult environment to be working in. There's a lot of pressure from patients to get their procedures done. People have had bills to pay that they haven't been able to pay, staff to pay. It, it, is, it is clearly, um, a difficult and, and messy situation, but it, it's not going to be possible for government to completely um, uh, offer complete clarity on this beyond the broad principles that we've um, we've articulated. So I might I might ask Tony what he um, he thinks of that from a college perspective. Yeah, thank you. I was I was going to uh, not only the college, but I know all the association presidents. By uh, Wednesday of next week, we will we'll all have had half a dozen complaints uh, about some of our colleagues who have been operating at midnight and don't know what one in four really means. So what, what do we all do, the college? Well, what can we do, the presidents, hearing about uh, uh, fellows of their associations who have not been following the government uh, uh, well, well described uh, slow introduction and a graduated they, they just put their finger up to, the, to your new rules uh, and uh, aren't, aren't complying. What can we do? Is, is that a question for me? That's for you, mate. Yeah, you put in the rule. <laughs> um, well, I mean, they, like I said, there's, there are some hard regulatory instruments that are potentially available. Um, to us. So we would expect hospital administrators to be keeping a close eye on this. And I understand that it's, you know, we, what we're talking about is a is an independent contractor effectively contracting with a with an independent private provider. And we're asking government to come in over the top and say, no, you can't do it. It's it's a it's a really it's a minefield. I'm not a regulator, but it doesn't sound easy to me. Um, 
but nonetheless, um, we we would expect private hospitals um, and day surgeries to take appropriate measures to maintain social distance and volume control in the next month. Um, and and there's going to be there's going to be a pretty close eye kept on it. Um, and and we found out as you did, Tony, um, and as professional as, as specialist societies found out on March 26th and and after March 31st, certainly. Um, it's not hard to find out about this stuff. People come to us. Um, so to think that people can do it somehow under the radar, um, I think would be a, sort of a, perhaps an error of judgment. Thanks, Nick. Uh, thank you, thank you, Nick. Look, th thank you, everyone. I mean, we're, we're coming to a close now and um, it's been an yeah, interesting yeah. session. Oh, Bridget, did you have a question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, can I ask a quick question, yeah. Nick? Um, sure. Max Ronald, who's the chair of our Indigenous Health Committee and her team put out a position paper over the weekend to ask us to specifically consider Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander patients in Australia um, to take into consideration their um, significant barriers to accessing healthcare in normal um, times, let alone pandemic times, um, their tendency to present late with uh, more advanced disease. Has um, your office looked at how we can prioritise treatment for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in this recommencement of elective surgery. Can we prioritise them? So I think I think the short answer is um, yes, we can prioritise them, and that the um, the plan for um, uh, Indigenous Australians in in COVID nineteen um, was updated today at AHPPC. Unfortunately, I wasn't I wasn't at that meeting, uh, but I'm going to take that on board and make sure that that um, is in clear um, agreement or articulation with the elective surgery resumption plan. Thank you. And, and, and I'm, sure, I'm sure that'll be an AHPPC statement, which we can, which all the AHPPC statements, by the way, for those that are interested, that go to National Cabinet are, are updated, uh, uploaded onto the AHPPC website. Every single one that's been made that National Cabinet's considered. Um, so they can be, be looked for there. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Nick. Any other last minute comments from our panel or questions? No? Well, thank you, everyone. When will the um, public? Sorry? When will the no, elective no. surgery resumption plan be published? When will the elective sorry. surgery plans be, elective surgery plans be published? Okay, so, so yeah. basically there's some, um, there's a more detailed document underneath the Prime Minister's um, press release today uh, that uh, offers the principles for surgical recommencement, and then that is going to be up to the systems. Um, uh, I'm using a lot of bureaucratic speak. Uh, that's going to be up to the states um, to implement in public hospitals, and it's up to CEOs of privates to to implement in the private sector. Um, it's going to give them sufficient information, um, but again, the Commonwealth's not in a position to be prescriptive about the implementation. Okay. All right, well, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, we will upload a link uh, of the recorded webinar on our website by Wednesday this week. We will be able to, to see that um, and we will have some frequently asked questions for you as well around PPE. So I'd like to thank Nick um, and the panel, our President Tony Spahn and Bridget and Guy uh, for their contribution to the webinar and thank you all for linking into the web webinar. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thanks, John. Thanks, Bridget. Thanks, Thanks very much, Nick. Thanks, Nick.